you know, and, and what, they, what people don't understand is when that happens and it gets out of whack, you know, such value is supposed to be fair market value. What a willing buyer or a willing seller would, would pay for that transaction to go through uh, under no you know, compulsion or, or not being compelled to buy or sell. They don't have a clue on, on how that works. They, they really don't. And, and the assessors are sitting there just using models and stuff, and it always goes up. And we went through one of the worst commercial property recessions in the history of the United States and the history of Iowa between 2008 and 2011. You couldn't give a piece of commercial property away in the state. Banks were foreclosing on all this stuff, selling it for pennies on the dollar. Did the assessed values go down? Well, we had equalization orders across the state raising assessed values in the middle of a commercial property recession. And, and you, can't, you can't touch the assessments because they're controlled by mayors, city councilmen, supervisors, the tax users. So that's something that's it's going to take a long time and a lot of people talk about trying to get an occupancy bill through and how hard that's going to be. Getting some reforms to the property assessment function is going to be extremely difficult, but it is extremely necessary when it comes to property tax relief so that you can actually pay a fair amount of property taxes on a fair value for your property. You know, Mr. President Baldwin, that is actually with the property tax reform bill, I have had calls from landlords who have seen their taxes go up, and it's because the locals are just, they're shooting out values way up just to make the, make the difference. Yeah, it's, it's, no, it's no surprise that when the legislature comes in and says, we are going to force assessed values on commercial properties down by 10%, and then change, change the, uh, the classification of multifamily structures from commercial to the residential. It's no surprise what the immediate reaction was right before the law went into effect. You know, you know I'll, I'll throw a company under the bus because that's what I do. <laughs> you know, shortly after I got married a lot of years ago, I was going to the shop for a Christmas gift for my wife. And uh, went to the mall and I went to Zales, Zales Jewelry Store. And I saw 70% off. <laughs> I was a smart shopper back then. <laughs> <laughs> so I go in and I look at, you know, I can't even remember what it was, but it's some piece of jewelry there. It's like, wow, this is really nice. Uh, you know, what's the retail price? Eight billion dollars. Seventy percent off, so you can get it for a lot less. You know, I, but anyway, but, but that's it's a similar notion, you know. You, you get these places that give you huge discounts. But they check the prices up before they do the discounts. And the same thing happens with property assessment. And the same thing, we saw it all over the state. Heard reports of it all over. Right before those, those, those property tax reforms and the assessment, assessment reforms came into play, assessed values went up so that they didn't lose any money. Because by God, you can't take a dollar away from a government entity. I don't know if you're on the handle one. <laughs> so we appreciate that. But, but uh, that, that's something that we need to work on. But as we get into it, we're going to need the support of a lot of folks like you that know what it's like to pay property taxes. Uh, and you pay a lot of it. And uh, you know, that's, that's something that, that we need to uh, we need to hear from you all. Because you all are not the, the devil. You're not evil. You're not out there trying to screw people over. Good, hard-working Iowans who have invested your own money, and your own time, and your own energy in providing much-needed housing for people of this state. And we in the legislature need to hear from you. We need to listen to you, and we need to support you. And I feel very confident, at least in the House, going forward, that we will do that. Uh, we've shown over the last few years that uh, we will take up measures that are important to you, and we will pass them. It's not always easy, it's not always fun, and we 
we take a lot of crap from Iowa City. <laughs> Speaking of Iowa City, can I jump in here one second? Please. Okay. Speaking of Iowa City, um, landlords have lots of arenas where they have to play. First of all, federal legislation, you have state legislation, you have local ordinances. So now you've got the judicial branch to worry about. Because the people in Iowa City, this, this tennis project in Iowa City with the attorney Christopher Warlock, is that his name, last name? Warlock. Yeah, he, yeah. I, I, I sent you just yesterday, you may not have had time to look at the video. Video, have you reviewed that yet? I haven't, I haven't seen it. Yeah, I, I saw it was there, but I haven't. What, 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 do you, what do you see this? Um, you should have said that it was a half hour. Oh, it was 38 minutes. Yeah, so. you should have said that. <laughs> yeah, because, well, anyway, I mean, I mean that, that's a test of how interested people really are. So, anyway, uh, it's, it's worth viewing. But this is the new arena, and I think the, the people who think landlords are bad have found a place where they can really play. And that's in the court system, and um, and, and it's coming out of Iowa City. And, and it, you know, hey, not everybody's perfect in Iowa City. There, there are some. Most of the legislation, bad legislation I've seen over the years I've lobbied, has emanated from something that happened in Iowa City. Um, so I'll just tell you that from experience. Um, but uh, this is this is a different arena. It's, it's one that's tough for us to play in. Uh, it, it necessitates finding the best attorneys that we can find to represent us, uh, and it's no cost of money. So. I, I don't follow the budget of this organization that carefully. I know you got a little bit in reserves, but uh, to be a part of this profession, you just can't nickel and dime anymore. If you're going to, you're going to play in the judicial branch, it's going to take money. You can't sit around and let bad decisions come because that's going to cost maybe even more money. So I just want to bring that up, and, and uh, I know you're busy representing Baltimore. You're probably aware of some of these cases, but there seems to be a plethora of cases coming out of Iowa City. They're winning. And when you win, you get momentum and you want more cases. Right. So I, I, that's the future I see, and, and it's, it's, it's a whole different arena. It's just you didn't have enough places to fight, now you got a new one. You know, I could, I could say as, as over the last three years as chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, I would wager that more than 50 bills have been filed in direct response to a poor Supreme Court decision. I think we spend a lot of time trying to fix stuff that they do, that you know, cases they come out, they are the final interpreters of what the law says, I guess, or means in a particular factual situation. But, I, but we spend a lot of time, uh, I'll tell you, I read every Supreme Court case that comes out, every single one. All, because I'm always looking for stuff that I think we need to fix. And there's no shortage of it. So, uh, you know, fortunately, they take a few months off in the summer, so they don't have to read so much. Um, but they're starting to gear up this year. They've got their back in session, and they're starting to issue decisions. Uh, I don't have time to read all of the Court of Appeals decisions, because there's more of those, and uh, I like to do some things other than read all day long and draft legislation that busts up the judicial branch. But, uh, but that's something that's important for us to pay attention to, too. I had a question, Jeff. You, you pass laws according to what their decisions are, or do they pass, or they do decisions according to what laws you pass? Oh, well, I mean, I mean their, their job is to take the laws that are on the books in a specific factual situation and determine whatever the, the, the outcome of whatever the dispute is under the laws that are written. Sometimes they interpret those laws poorly. Okay. Uh, hard to believe that we don't always, you know, we don't always draft the legislation with every scenario in mind. And sometimes you get a fact pattern that's kind of weird and it doesn't really fit very well. And sometimes the language we use in the bills isn't clear. And that leaves it open to judicial interpretation. And they'll make up their own interpretations uh, as they go. So it's, it's, it's kind of a back and forth. I mean, if they, if they make a, a decision on, a, on the existing law that we don't agree with, or I don't agree with, I'm going to file a bill and we're going to, we're going to change the law so that we don't have that situation going forward. 
for them to interpret. But they, they still get to interpret it when, when a case comes before them again later on. So it's kind of a circle. It's a circle of legislative and judicial life, really. I mean, we kind of feed off of each other a lot. So with that, uh, you know, I just, again, I want to thank you. You all have been very supportive of, of me personally and of the things that we've been trying to do. Anytime we get a bill that deals with, uh, with landlord issues, I hear from many of you, uh, and I greatly appreciate that. I, I try to tell your stories when I can to my fellow legislators so that they understand and hear from you through me. Uh, I would encourage you to always get a hold of me if there's an issue that you've got uh, that you think we can do something about. Uh, but really, I, I too want to just thank you for for being here today and for doing what you're doing out there. Uh, if you've got any questions, we'll, we'll take those uh, and then I'll sit down. Yes? Uh, you all have been passed about the Secretary of State's office. Right. You know, in case anybody couldn't hear, the, the question was, you know, we passed a law last year that said that victims of domestic abuse can uh, keep their mailing address in the residence private by having all of their mail shipped to the Secretary of State's office. And the Secretary of State then forwards that to, to them. It's, not, it's an effort to keep, you know, those stalkers and, and serial domestic abusers from being able to find out where their victims are and all that. Um, and, and so the, the question was, where, where are the rules and, and, and procedures to follow the help there? That's being administered by the Secretary of State's office. And the Secretary of State, uh, Paul Pate and his staff, uh, should be able to help uh, with that and give you some, some clarification on on what you what you can do as a landlord uh, on that, uh, and, and what would happen on that. I have not followed up with them to find out where they're at in that rulemaking process. Maybe they're not as far along as, as they should be, but that was supposed to take effect in July. So, um, well, the money portion there's a money there's a money portion to that bill, so they have money to administer the program. But the actual substance of the bill takes effect in January. They, they delayed that to January 1. So, um, I'm like the Bricks in Baltimore. I have not talked to Paul Payton about it. Um, I try to review the administrative rules review bulletin frequently. I don't think I've seen anything. Uh, but I, I would think in the next couple of months that he need to get started with that. Otherwise, he's going to be a little late. Uh, getting My big problem here today is that my computer is up and uh -oh. my contacts are getting information. Uh -oh. So, I don't even know who I was saying. Yeah, contact the Secretary of State's office. And really, the, the, the law does have uh, language in there saying that this program uh, shall not interfere with the Iowa Tenant Law. So that there, I mean, it shouldn't, you know, things can still get screwed up even though it, that's what you're worried about, Carl, I know. But that bill had a lot of momentum. Uh, I think 30, 40 states have similar laws. so. Pretty hard to stand up, try to say we don't need that law. I'm not sure it's going to really work as well as people think it's going to work. But uh, I was questioning whether you want to turn the Secretary of State's office into a post office. Right. I mean, I mean, how's he? I mean, mail goes to him, but then he's got to get to the people, uh, the, the victims. How's he going to do that? I mean, mail the door. Yes. He mails it to them. They've got a special post office box, and that's how they get it to them. Oh, they got a box at the post office. Right, box the post office. Okay, so they don't mail it to the post office. Yeah. So the, so the uh, abuser just hangs around the post office when they show up. Could be, you yeah. know. All I have to do to be like a stand-up comedian and go on circuit is tell true stories from the woman's <laughs> <laughs> And make that port. All right, well listen, thank you again for uh, letting me uh, stand up here and yak for a while. Uh, I'm sure you've got a lot of other stuff to address today, but uh, anyway.
Thank you very much. I'm great. Thank you so much, Representative Baltimore, for coming here on a Saturday morning. And I know you got things to do, but you're actually going to sit around for a while. That's good. Okay, nine minutes. <laughs> I'd like to start out by just saying, uh, do you have any questions that are on your mind right now? I just didn't answer questions just to try to fill the time. You know I can fill the time. All right, you know, the other technique is, is that you just stand here and don't say anything. People will eventually get nervous and they'll ask a question. Sharon. I want to thank Chip. Or Cheryl. You're not Sharon, you're Cheryl. I want to thank Chip for supporting our 911 bill last year. Everything he did to help us get that through. Um, where are we at with that? And is there anything as a group we can do? Okay, 911 bill. Uh, and, and I know Cheryl is very interested in this, as is Bob and everybody from Cedar Rapids, because Cedar Rapids is the main city at play here. And I think the hardest thing to try to explain to Cheryl is that she and I have talked and emailed a lot, is that sometimes less is more and, and you're very enthusiastic about how to pass this bill but ACLU has to take the lead in the Senate landlords are not an adored and beloved organization in the Iowa Senate so you don't want them to stand up and say this is a landlord's bill I'm lying low I talked I've had probably 20 conversations with ACLU over the interim. Believe me, things are going on. Strategies are being outlined. Contacts are being made. But the last thing I want, the last thing I want to see is you at the Capitol. I mean, I, I say this with all honesty. I do not want to see you at the Capitol pushing that bill. I want you to stay out of the morning. <laughs> 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 go, see, go see your daughter, go shopping, go to the movies, do something, but don't come, unless I call you, if I, if I want you there, I think I need you there, but right now my thinking is, I don't want you anywhere near there talking about that bill, because they're just going to use it against us. The, the deal we made with ACLU about a year ago is that we would be the lead in the House and they would be the lead in the Senate. Now, they, they sell you, also work the house. That was fine. I had no problem with that. But uh, we did promise that we were going to try to pass. I just, I just know from getting my head beat up against the wall enough that it just won't work. You'll play right into their hands if you, if you overdo it. Uh, if that bill ever gets to the floor of the Senate, it'll pass. It will pass. I think we probably need to work more with the Senate Republicans than we do anybody else just to make sure they know we like it. You know, we don't want them just to have a, a, a knee jerk reaction that, oh, the Senate Democrats like this bill, we hate it. You know, it's an ACLU bill. That's probably what we need to do is make sure that the Senate Republicans know that this bill has benefits for landlords to make sure they like it. That's, that's the kind of thing we need to do. Uh, but, you know, Lynn County. You don't have that many options of Republican senators to call, do you? So your work's done. <laughs> yeah, uh, we'll make sure that uh, Minority Leader Dix knows that, that we have an interest in this. And those of you who have Republican senators where you live, you would want to tell them that, oh yeah, you, you may hear that this is an ACLU bill, but we've got a vested interest in this bill. We think it's a, a good bill and a fair bill. So that, that would be... And I'm not making any guarantees. I, don't, I, I can't stand up here today and tell you that bill's going to necessarily pass. I, I, I don't think that the Senate Democrats would let that languish for two straight years and irritate two interest groups of theirs, but maybe they will. I don't know. I've seen this. I don't understand this whole political season at all. I, the national stuff, I, don't, I just don't even know what's going on. I've, this is the first time in my life since the... I've been following the election since... Uh, 1956. I grew up in Tennessee, and our our senior senator Estes Kefauver ran for vice president in 1956. So 
there out as a young kid. Uh, I didn't like politics then, so I was following that on TV. And this this young man named John Kennedy was running against Justice Kefauver for Vice President. John Kennedy got in real late. And the best thing that ever happened to Kennedy is, is that he didn't get to be Vice President on that ticket because Eisenhower won a landslide re-election in 1956. So all Kennedy did was introduce himself to a national audience. People saw this young, articulate guy. And, you know, our best team offer was far from articulate, but he was visible. He did a lot of things, did a lot of hearings, and the people back home, you know, one of their own was involved, so we kind of liked that. But as a young guy, I saw that Kennedy guy. I said, this guy's pretty good, you know, I bet in 1960 gets election. I just told you how old I am. I realized, I just now realized that when Representative Baltimore was born, I was like a junior in college, so this is pretty absurd, so. Someday, if you're lucky, you'll be as old as I am. So, <clears throat> so okay, Cheryl, I hope you understand that. And I, I appreciate your passion for the bill, and usually I would say, go get them. But uh, believe me, ACLU is really all over this thing. They're really, really perturbed at the Senate Democrats. They really are. They're, they've been showing up at some of these public forums uh, going after some of the Democrats. So we'll let, let's stay out of the way and just watch the fun. And, 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 I'm, I'm, I just tell them, call us if you if you need, need us to do something. I think the thing we do is make sure the Senate Republicans understand that this is a bill that, that we would like. All right, next. What, what other question do we have? All right, in the back. And then you, and then you, Bob, and then Bob. Bob and Bob. I was wondering if we can't get a little relief on our notice requirements. For, uh, relief on notice requirements, specifically well, like uh, your three-day notice, you used to be able to give them three days notice. Now it's like five or six days notice because of the way the judiciary counts the days. Well, yeah, this all goes back to the War Eagle Iowa Supreme Court case of yes. uh, 2010. I think it was 2010. Boy, that was a doozy. And, and um, it had to do with a provision that was legitimate. It was in the code. It appeared to be legitimate. I think it was when it was landlord tenant law was first passed, but it had to do with how certified mail works. And I guess a lot of people, I didn't realize that certified mail had gotten so sloppy. And I guess as the Postal Service has lost so much money over the years that they, I've seen postal carriers, you probably have too, going around and, and they do time studies. They want to make sure they're going as fast as they can. So what happened is, is that certified mail, they, they just don't go up and try to track you down when they come to your house. I mean, this factual situation, I think there was not much effort made to get the certified mail to the tenant. Um, the other side saw a chance to take this issue. Uh, certified mail was the only means of uh, contact for this FED. No personal service. There was a loophole in the law. I mean, I knew a couple of lawyers that worked on the original 1978 bill. I wasn't there in 78, but I called them up. I said, did you slip this little nugget in there? And they all said, oh, no, I didn't do that. But anyway, um, what Bob is talking about is, is that war eagle case. And, the, the, and I think really, I was part of the, uh, the Bar Association put together a group with uh, Attorney General's office and legal aid and the realtors and the other landlord in interests and tried to hammer out uh, a law that um, complied with the Iowa Supreme Court rule. And I, I didn't really agree with everything that was done on that. And I, and I think. I think the assumption that it takes three days for mail to be delivered is a bad assumption. Because I, I talked to the Postal Service and they said that uh, basically if you're in your own town, there's like a 99.9% .9 chance that the, the first class mail is going to get there the next day. And pretty much 99% the next day in Iowa. But to say that you assume that it's going to take three days for mail to be delivered and received. It's kind of crazy, and it's kind of a way. And I and I think that you know the people that don't like what you do, and are on the res, you know, the victims, so so resident victims side would say, anything we can do to delay things is a good thing. So I mean that's sort of a way of of um, elongating. So if you can dodge personal service and make the landlord post and send regular mail and send certified mail, you've added four days to the process. Um, Carl, I think something you were talking about to me yesterday, 
Tell me again, give me a couple of facts about what you were talking about, because I think this kind of works together. You're talking about, oh, grace periods, grace periods. Carl is saying that in Council Bluffs, uh, there's an effort being made to go to the legislature and mandate grace periods. And you think, well, you know, some people may not have grace periods, but most people, most landlords I know have a grace period, and it's usually five days. But if you can mandate that, then what you've done, we have a three-day notice to cure rent in this state. You know what it was in the original Uniform Law Commissioner's model legislation that the Iowa legislature used to base its landlord tenant law on? 14 days. 14 days to pay rent. Uniform Law Commissioners have come out with their revised version, and that will be sent to the legislature. And uh, I can send it to anybody that wants it. I may send it to everybody. It's about 65 pages. Would you like a copy? Yeah, you'll get a copy. And you know what they've done is they've taken a lot of the original model and then they've added some sections to it, and changed a few things around. But the legislature, if and when this is sent to the legislature, they're going to see that 14 days to cure rent is still a suggestion from the Uniform Law Commissioners. So this whole mandatory grace period is another way of getting, you know, instead of three days to cure rent, you know, move it up to eight, nine days. To, that's that's the way I see, the, yeah, how that's going. So, yes, and I've got Bob here and then you. Chip, thank you so much. Let's give Chip another round of applause. Oh, you got one for Chip? Yeah. Well, do it now. Okay. He's got to go. Well, well, one more quickie. The only question is, is part of this head thing that's going on is um, it's about the, the verbiage of fees. Do you get any feedback uh, in your meetings about the word fees in the leases? Uh, not really. Not really. Okay. Is it an al alternate word or positive rather than have a fee? With in other words, if someone's late, rather than have a fifty dollars fee, it, the rent would be just fifty dollars more. Or uh, while you're thinking about that, let me let me let me jump in here one thing. This is interesting. When you get old, you have to say stuff for you. Yeah. <laughs> the the Uniform Law Commissioner's new version has a definition of fees, so they're putting sanction on fees. That's the one good thing that jumped out. They're saying fees are okay. They describe what a fee is. Yeah, we, I mean, we did change late fees. Yeah, we did the late fee thing. Yeah. Um, we haven't heard anything from a legislative perspective about what's included, what's not, how you can get around that concept with a rent escalation clause or something like that. Um, so we, we haven't seen anything like that, uh, probably because we haven't had any uh, disaffected tenants Complain to the right groups that would bring it to us. Yeah. If I haven't, but if there, if there are issues with that that you're experiencing, make sure you know, let Joe know or let me know, and we'll, we'll dig through that. Yeah. Well, they have. They have. I, I guess part of the issues are is, is that all of a sudden they have problems with uh, the clean fees or pet fees or uh, whatever with late fees. And, and, you know, everything was called a fee that if they didn't pay the rent on time, or if they didn't claim the pro uh, property uh, 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 um, property. Yeah. Um, instead of, you know, what, what do you call this? I mean, what is what is the penalty if they don't want to do the property lease or do the property? You know, it's a contract, so they aren't fulfilling the contract. Is, and I look at it as it's, it's kind of a release of their responsibility. Because they take away all these things that are going to penalize somebody for not fulfilling the contract. Are you having magistrates that are refusing to enforce those? Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and some of the other judges now are looking at what's happening in Iowa City, and and, and they're they're saying, hey, you know, this all these fees, you can't do that. Can I say way on that a little bit? There's a magistrate in Waterloo that any small claims that comes in front of him that has any addendums added, bold addendum of any kind, any other addendums above the Iowa Bar Association lease, they're automatically rejected. Because <laughs> the Bar Association knows everything. <laughs> Just 
say. <laughs> wow. Mm -hmm. that, that's, give me information on that. Okay. I might know some people on the Supreme Court. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Andrew, G give, me, give, me give me information about that. Right. that I mean, especially that is, is just simply egregious, and yeah. that's that's a judicial function that is broken. Okay, Andrew. One of the things you mentioned when you first started speaking, Joe, was about the importance of uh, a judicial system and how we may need to step up our game a little bit and maybe. Uh, preparing for more litigation, one of the things I think would be important is that we appeal some of these, more and more of these cases. Maybe, you know, we get these groups to work together and, and establish a legal aid fund, but for landlords, not for the tenants. Uh, and the second question is, if you would speak about uh, what you do in Des Moines with the PAC funds and how it, it helps maybe to buy a, a, at least a seat at the table for a conversation with uh, well, first of all, I'd like to ask, um, thank you, Andrew, I'd like to ask Representative Baltimore his general opinion of amicus briefs, because this organization has been asked to file an amicus brief in a particular upcoming case. I, I, I don't, I'm not an expert on this, and I'm certainly not an attorney, so I'd like to hear what you think of generally, a general feeling about what an amicus brief does, or is it, is it worth a money here? Well, I, I, I think you should do it. Uh, you know, an amicus brief is simply uh, a, a brief with a legal analysis that is filed in an appellate case, not by one of the parties, but by an interested group or an interested person. And obviously, it, uh, the landlord association would uh, could file a, a brief that says, "Hey, here's here's how we have analyzed this particular case in the law from our perspective, even though we're not a party to this to this fight that's going on." Um, if you don't do one, they're not going to hear from you all as a group. So they may very well just disregard it, but it's important, I think, that, that they hear from you, because you know the ACLU is going to file a bunch, and, and you know, the, the different victims out there, uh, mainly the tenants, are going to be able to get some, some additional uh, voices before the appellate judges, and I think it if there's an issue that's extremely important that's going up on the field, I think you should. I think you should. Um, I've been asked to write a few from the legislative perspective, which is interesting. I'm sticking my nose into the judicial branches business, but why not? Um, so, so I think you should. Uh, if, it's, if it's an issue that you think is, is going to be very, very important, yeah. Um, I, I would do it for you. Right. But, but Andrew's right, you, you, you've got to appeal some of these really, really bad things. I mean, you, otherwise, you just, if you end up swallowing it, then two things happen. One, it becomes legal precedent that they end up following. And two, knuckle-headed judges or magistrates think that they can basically own their own little kingdom and make up the rules regardless of what they think. And once you give them that idea in their head, they're going to do it all the time. So uh, I would I would appeal those adverse cases, um, especially the ones that are really really bad, like that one. Well, uh, two of the other ones that they're kind of trying to get changed for joint several liability. They're trying to get that out of our contract, and they're also trying to uh, say that we can't have any sign more than thirty days before the start date. I mean, these are things that are going to affect landlords drastically. Uh, well, yeah, neither one of those are going to go through. I can tell you that because they're going to come to my committee and they're not going to go. You're talking about a legal challenge or the court or that? Okay. And all this work that he's doing, these are a couple of the weird things that he's trying to promote. And that's if you go through the judicial. Is that actually in a case yet, or is he, are they thinking yeah. that that might be bad? You really shouldn't talk to Southgate in here because this guy is setting precedent. And they're the pieces they're bringing up are, are tenants that have left already. 
and they really don't have ground for, they're just trying to change laws in it. That use, you know, they're about politics. They aren't about really being unhappy with the way Southgate, you know, handled their um, tenancy. Okay, any, any more questions for Brent and Bones? Contact with him. Okay, I'll do that. All right. That's the representing Baltimore go. Thank you very much. Not surprising. Okay, we have about um, 15 managers off left. Bob, I think we've, you've been very patient waiting for your chance to ask another question. There's a, I heard that there's a new model for Matt I, I'll repeat the question since you may not have heard it in the back. Bob said he's heard that there is a new uniform law commissioner model of legislation on landlord tenant. That is correct. Uh, the uniform law commis commission has been around for a long time. It's made up of a lot of uh, former, uh, sometimes, uh, well, they're all, almost everybody on it's an attorney, retired judges, current lawyers. We have Iowa has three people that are on the commission, including the guy who used to be the head of law school, Drake. He's still a trade, but uh, so what they do is that they come up with tons of different kinds of subjects, all kinds of subjects where they think there's disparity among the laws. They, they try to use the word uniform is, is telling you they want the laws to be as similar around the country as possible, which I'm not sure that's necessarily a great idea, but that's sort of the thinking of it. Let's, let's make sure that uh, these laws are well thought out and sort of uniform. So they take all different kinds of subjects and they try to get the best thinking that they can and they come up with suggestions to state legislatures. <coughs> they send it out to all 50 states. And that happened with landlord tenant back in 1972. The Uniform Law Commission decided that there are all kinds of systems going on about landlord, including uh, just the common law from, from England. But uh, there have been enough uh, rumblings that the Uniform Law Commission thought that they should suggest the legislature is a good model of landlord tenant law. Iowa took this, uh, I think in 74, they finally got through the system. They're, they're a big bureaucracy. It sometimes takes a couple of years to get a bill totally written and going through their system. 1974, it was sent to legislatures. Iowa was the sixth state in the country to pass it. But they did pass it. Here's the thing about a model piece of legislation. They don't have to pass it in, in its entirety. They can pick and choose. Like I said earlier, 14 days to cure rent, the Iowa legislature said in 1978, that's not, that's not good. We'll go over three. Uh, and that's the way we've been ever since. But yes, they now feel that it needs to be revised. And they've got a huge section in there on domestic violence. That's one of the new things that's in the law. And the other thing I, I told you about is they've actually put a definition of a fee in there. And you probably like that. That would settle this discretion fees. But if this comes up next year and they're not sure that it will, it's, it will probably come through the Bar Association because uh, Professor Walker uh, is pretty close to the Bar Association and he usually sends his stuff to them and, and they probably say, well, why don't you introduce the Bar Association? And maybe the Bar, if they decide to do it, they'll probably do like they did on the War Eagle decision. They'll invite interested groups and parties to sit down and try to hash this out because with the Republicans running the House and the Democrats running the Senate, there will be no landlord-tenant law, uh, law passed unless every interest group signs off on it, uh, like we did on late fees. I think the, the issue for us is when you get into those kinds of in, uh, engagements, you have to decide because we'll probably have to give up something. We'll have to figure out what it is that we want. But at the same time, the other side's going to want something out of you guys. And so, if you're comfortable with that, uh, I don't think that we got hurt uh, on the late fees. I mean, some of you may disagree. But the real issue on late fees is the legal doctrine of willfully doing wrong. That's a huge standard to prove. Yes, we went up on late fee violations from blanket $200 to up to two times rent. 
yeah, that's a big jump, but my gosh, it's been $200 since 1978. You think $200 is worth the same today as it was in 78? Yeah, it should have been raised. Uh, maybe some of you think not that much, but first of all, you have to lose. First of all, you have to do something willfully wrong. Secondly, it has to be proven that you did it willfully wrong. And then the judge doesn't have to do two months against you. May or may not do that. So that's, and I'm going to send this out, and, and maybe a lot of people may not want to get this from me, but you can always delete it. But uh, I may even yesterday send it out to you, the, uh, the model legislation. And I would recommend that those of you particularly who are on the board or have a deep interest in this kind of thing, it would be good for you to start reading that. You've got time. It's only early October. You don't have to get it done by the end of the month or anything. But uh, it would be nice to get your viewpoints on it, the parts that you like, the parts that you don't like. And we can start kind of working a little chart up. Well, then, you know, then we'll know. It may not even come up in, in 2016. It, it may be that the interest groups, may, the, the ones who want drastic change, may want to wait and see what the elections do in 2016. Because you know, they may think, oh, we get you know, total control. The Democrats have both sides, but still they got to go to France to deal with it. So anyway, I, I can't predict. They passed the thing in July, and they probably shipped it out, and we'll see what happens. OK, who's next? What other questions do you have? You have any other? Uh, and, and, I, and I don't like I say the way things are right now. I know landlord tenant is what it cites. Gets the most unity in the group. Uh, you get other issues like uh, occupancy. That's more important. The two or three of our chapters than others. Uh, the thing in Cedar Rapids is probably more important to the Cedar Rapids chapter than maybe the other chapters for this for sure.
hundred enemies. Well, <laughs> now I gotta go to where we don't get sure to go to the world. Big deep, very deep. So get your little tickets out. Winners and losers are going through my fingertips right now. When will he stop? I'm looking for peanut M and M down here. He's looking for the coded one with my name on it. There you go. All right. Ticket number is nine four seven eight one. Anybody get excited yet? Eight nine four seven eight one eight. I see we have a hand up there. Get excited! Come on! Well, come on! Yes. I was going to say, please, please, bring some of your details. So great, just uh, see Katie in the back and she'll uh, hook you up with your TV. If we want to get uh, photo ops of you and your TV for a national publication, that'd be great also. All right, guys, uh, just a quick little story I want to share with you about this uh, young man who was having a little trouble paying his rent. He just so happened to be an inspiring actor. He was a little behind, kind of a little tough. His acting gates were a little slow, and so he approached his landlord and says, you know, I don't have your rent money today, but I promise you I will in a couple days. I just got one more gig to get. The landlord says, well, son, let's see what we can do here. You know, but I promise you, I promise you, just say, someday people are going to look back. When I'm famous, they're going to say, you know, Johnny Smith lived in that house, that famous actor. The landlord says to him, he says, son, if you don't have the rent to me by tonight, they'll be saying that tomorrow. <laughs> I tell you what, before um, our next speaker comes on, if you guys want to take a short little break, it's uh, what, about 5, 10 to 40 hour now. Yeah, it's uh, 8 before the hour, so we can take an 8 minute break and uh, we're we'll back in our seats by 10 o'clock for our next speaker. That'll be great, thank you.